Well, uh, Mark Dever, welcome to the Carl F. H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding at Trinity International University. We're grateful for your ministry. We're grateful that you could be here with us today. Mark, of course, is senior pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church and has been since 1994 Mm -hmm. and is widely read, uh, especially for his ecclesiological writings, which is what we're going to talk about today. I, the questioner, my name is Steve Farish, and I'm the senior pastor of Crossroads Church in Grace Lake nearby, and I'm a board member of the Henry Center, and it's my privilege, Mark, to be with here, you here this morning to uh, put this interview on our website for the benefit of pastors and others and for the glory of God, mostly. I'd like to begin with a question about church discipline because you've written a lot about church discipline, and you are one of the major voices in the American evangelical church advocating biblical church discipline. As your church, Capitol Hill Baptist Church, practices church discipline, Mark, what are some of the passages of Scripture that you look to for guidance, that you root your procedure in? Steve, first of all, thank you for uh, letting me be here. It's a privilege to be with you uh, and here at Trinity with the Carl Henry Center. I think the passages for church discipline that we normally think of are Matthew 18, Jesus' words, and the example in 1 Corinthians 5. There are other smaller passages we could go to (coughs) in Paul's letters to the Thessalonians about work and about association with others, Galatians 6. Uh, But mainly, I think we think of uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and then Jesus' words in Matthew 18. For what sort of sins has your church practiced church discipline in the years that you've been there? And when we read about church discipline, ordinarily uh, we're told that the sins involved should be public, uh, that they should be unrepented from, obviously, Mm -hmm. and at the level of serious sins. Would you discuss what sort of sins your church has disciplined people for? Well, let me first start, if I can, sort of further out and, and okay. focus in. When we use the word discipline, um, normally today, I think, church discipline is shorthand for excommunication or exclusion, yes. which is fine. But if I can just pull back, discipline is is being discipled. It, it is how you walk. So uh, it, it's not historically in English associated merely with excommunication. So discipline is is both formative and corrective. Formative, it's everything we teach. Like even right now, this conversation, if it's being watched by a Christian, uh, we would say that this is part of formative discipline. We are teaching, intending to anyway, by having this conversation. Corrective church discipline is when we have to correct someone. And that can be accepted. And there could be it could never move to the, that final right. level Jesus talks about. <clears throat> So all of that could be called church discipline. And this wider usage is borne testimony to even by in the United Methodist Church, their book of discipline. Well, it's not a book all about excluding people from the church. It just means the way they will live, how they resolve to live. So church discipline, formative, corrective. Let's click on corrective. Okay, corrective church discipline, many stages from a conversation saying, brother, I don't know if you're right here or this concerns me, on to, look, this is sin. You need to stop this. On to, look, I'm going to have to bring some others to talk with you. On to, and I, I don't think in Matthew 18, Jesus means to give us exhaustive steps. I, I think right. uh, I think the sort of principles you see are a private first, the involvement of others, and finally the church must speak and judge, the congregation as a whole. Um, but I think if if you are trying to bring repentance and you put other steps in there, with that end, that, that can be fine, depending on what they are. But anyway, it's that final stage when the church speaks to someone and, and asks them, confronts them with their sin and asks them to repent. And if the person is not, uh, is not willing to respond to that, then you would withdraw fellowship from them, to use some 19th century language, or exclude them from membership or excommunicate them. Now, when, when we excommunicate, we're doing something very different than the Roman Catholic Church at least historically. I think everything's up for grabs since Vatican II. But if we can just climb back to 1959 and before, uh, when the Roman Catholic Church excommunicated, it was saying, we are cutting you off from the means of grace. Communion, X, 
we're cutting you off yes. from the Eucharist, from, from God's grace through the sacraments, through the ministry of the church. And therefore, we are effectively consigning you to hell. Uh, at least purgatory, but probably hell, because you may well commit a mortal sin or may have committed a mortal sin, which got you excommunicated. Protestant churches have never meant that by excommunication. Protestant churches have never understood that the church controls the means of grace in that sense. So when, when we are excommunicating someone, what we're saying is we, as this church, you know, Crossroads Church, we can no longer say that you, Tom, are evidencing the fruit of God's Spirit. We can no longer say that you give credible evidence that the profession you make of following Christ is true. And so... We are responsible for Christ's name being attached to you publicly. And therefore, publicly, we are withdrawing that sponsorship. Mm -hmm. We are saying we, we love you. We are not doing this out of vengefulness. We're doing this out of love for God, love for you, love for others. But we will not allow the name of Christ to be misportrayed by the way you're living while you continue to call yourself a Christian at, with our approval. So with great sadness... We are pulling that name off of you. Uh, and we're not saying we know you're going to hell. Uh, we're simply saying, we're certainly not saying you can no longer be an object of God's grace. We are continuing to call you to repentance. But we are saying we can no longer say that you are walking around as an example of what it means to follow Christ mm -hmm. as a Christian. So everyone who is in regularly welcome to the Lord's table at your church, who's a communing person, a member, uh, those people, we as a church, are effectively saying, yeah, they sin, they struggle, they fall, but they repent. They are exercising faith and repentance regularly. This is what it means to be a Christian. But, but when you get someone who's stuck, who will not repent, who self-consciously, deliberately has been told this is a sin and will not repent of it, then you're in the territory where we as a congregation would need to excommunicate them. And uh, what have we done that for? Well, it has to be sort of publicly demonstrable sins. So th they can't come to me and say, Mark, you're prideful. We're going to excommunicate you for your pride. Or Mark, you're greedy. We're going to excommunicate you for your greed. <clears throat> those, those are, uh, they're, they're true. They're not necessarily demonstrable. They'd be true of too many people. Evidence of not trying to repent for it would be difficult. Uh, church discipline in that final stage of excommunication, I think, deals with a fairly narrow range of sins. Mm -hmm. And those, not the deepest sins, uh, but sins that would be publicly demonstrable where the congregation could be unified in understanding, yes, we perceive this sin to be being committed, and we perceive together that this, is, that this person is not repented of it. And so therefore, with, with sadness and yet certainty, we vote, or however your congregation would do it, we, we acknowledge that this man should be removed from being welcomed to the Lord's table. Now, Mark, we recognize that watching this interview will be pastors from a variety of traditions, a variety of denominational backgrounds. You and I are both Southern Baptist pastors, and it is not typical. But you're in Chicago. <laughs> and we're on the north side of Chicago. Okay. So we're even on the wrong side. But no. uh, nevertheless, it has not been typical within our denomination, at least from the 20th century mm -hmm. onward, to have an elder-led congregation and yet you have advocated within our denomination and within evangelicalism generally an elder-led model form of church government. Could you describe for us how elders and deacons function within your congregation? Yeah. Basically, we would follow the model of the apostles and deacons in Acts 6. The apostles gave themselves to the ministry of word and prayer, uh, they were also deacons, but they were deacons. That's the word that's used. But uh, they were servants of the right. word and prayer. Mm -hmm. And the other deacons that were chosen to take care of the strains between the Greek-speaking and Aramaic-speaking widows, uh, those deacons were the ones who were to take care of what we would say are sort of fiscal and financial matters. So we think that there are spiritual aspects to fiscal and financial matters. So even those deacons should be under the leadership of the elders. But the elders are the ones who have the charge to make sure the Word of God is rightly taught. And you, you do have deaconesses in your church, do we you do. not? We uh, do. Yes. We think there's a good argument to say Phoebe was a deaconess, though we know it's by no means slam dunk 
uh, in our own Baptist tradition, uh, our church in 1878 was set up with deaconesses, deacons and deaconesses, so it's not unusual in Baptist churches at all to have deaconesses. Now, I think if you're in a church where there are not elders and the deacons have effectively become the leadership body in the church, then I would not have deaconesses, at least not that were part of that body, because I think right. that violates what Paul very clearly says to Timothy uh, in 1 Timothy 2 about women not being an authority over, not teaching, and not being an authority in that sense over, over men in the church. So we wouldn't advocate female deacons the way many Baptist churches today are set up. But if you have uh, a male eldership, then I think there's no problem you restore, returning to what I think is a New Testament and a certainly a historical Baptist pattern of having deaconesses as well. So our deacons and deaconesses do not work together as a body. They're not a deliberate body. It's sort of second house of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, they are simply <clears throat> servants who help lead various groups of other members to do service in the For church. For example, I've looked at your website, and I think the person who leads your audiovisual ministry is considered a, a deacon or yeah. a deaconess. Yeah, that's, that, he's a deacon. He's a man right now, but yeah, that's right. Okay. But so, yeah. so like for our ministry of hospitality, making sure we've got everything ready for after service, uh, we've had women usually do that. It doesn't need to be a woman, but they're the ones who express interest. Okay. You alluded to it yesterday in the um, the lecture you gave, uh, to which I also commend everybody who would be watching this interview as well. That will be on the Henry Center website. You alluded to the oversight that the elders at Capitol Hill Baptist Church give to the congregation. And I found that very interesting. Uh, it sounded at points like, some of the counsel that Richard Baxter gave mm. in Reform Pastor about the oversight by the, the pastor and the other elders. And certainly it appears to be rooted in 1 Peter 5 and that picture mm -hmm. of elders as the shepherds of the yeah. congregation. But could you give to the, the listening uh, audience here some idea of how your elders function in that role in particular, oversight of the uh, the spiritual life of the individuals within the congregation, soul care, if you will, yeah. or the cure of souls within the congregation. Well, first, just to the sort of uh, th sort of things that are behind me, urging me onto that, there is sort of the ghost of Baxter, you know, as there is to anybody who loves the Puritans. If you've read the Reformed Pastor, and you're a pastor, his example is amazing. His congregation was larger than ours. Uh, I think he, they maybe had, I can't remember, maybe 1,200 in attendance mm -hmm. uh, regularly. And they would try to visit with. Now, they would actually have the members come to them. But he and his associate, together, would try to visit with all of the families twice a year. Right. Which I just find nearly unbelievable. <laughs> uh, but so I've got that. I've also got this, this quotation I'm always giving from John Brown in the 19th century, who writes to uh, uh, one of his young pupils who's just been made minister, over a small congregation, and uh, he says something to the effect that, you know, I, I know the, the pride of your heart and that you will find it difficult that your congregation is so small in comparison with those of your brothers around you, but take it on the word of an old man uh, that you will find when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ that you have had enough. Mm -hmm. And that sort of brings not the modern American's uh, weight of we want more in order to validate or make our ministry successful, um, but we want to be sure of those that we have and be helpful to them. And, and that's why I love funerals. You know, another one, safe home. You know, I, yeah. just, I just love funerals. Uh, weddings, I'm happy for somebody else to do. But funerals, I, I, I love doing. But then also, it's just straight biblical, Hebrews 13, 17, the thought of us giving account uh, for those who are in our care. So practically, we have a, what we call a membership directory, which is a, a, a booklet. Uh, that has photographs, names, and information for all of our members in alphabetical order. We update it every week. Uh, we encourage members of the church to use that as a prayer guide daily. So this morning in my quiet time, I prayed through a page of that. Uh, it's the 31st today, so I pray, pray through page 31 uh, of the directory. Um, we also, as elders in our elders meeting, will have a section where we pray through the membership directory. Now, we don't pray through all names but we literally go through page by page, praying for a few people on each page. And then we have a...